Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? You doing good? Man, it's so great to see you. Welcome to the Vineyard. My name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest or a visitor, let me extend a special welcome to you. I'm so happy that you chose to join us today. We really hope that you feel welcome, that you get to meet some friendly people, and of course, experience God's presence. We're going to start with a time of worship. So would you join me in standing? And before we get started, why don't you quickly just take a moment to say hello to someone close to you, shake their hand, give them a high five, tell them what your name is, maybe make a new friend, and we'll get started. Rain. 
love powerful, but it will never fail us. So let's raise our voices today. Sing this to Him. Jesus today. 
So let's really do our best to focus on Him and sing these words directly to Him. Christ alone. room with our voices today. Oh Christ uh, Sing it out. Jesus, we worship you today. We lift your name high, Lord. And Father, would you remind us right now of your love for us? Would you remind us right now that you're always with us? Maybe remind us of those times where we felt like you weren't there, God, and show us where you were, because we know that you are faithful to us. 
Jesus, I thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Would you continue to bless us, God? Would you continue to provide for us every single day? Pour out more of your Holy Spirit as we worship you. And it's in your powerful name that we pray. Amen. And as always, it's great to see you. It's great to worship with you. Before you take a seat, there's Bannery someone nearby that maybe you haven't met yet. So you could turn in the other direction than you did before. Find a new face and introduce yourself. Make a new friend. And then take a seat. Thanks. Nikki and I serve in Vineyard Kids. The message is right around the corner, but first we'd like to share a little bit about the classes and events coming up here at the Vineyard. Welcome to our churchwide campaign, The Real Jesus. Whether you have been following Jesus for years or you're just curious about who Jesus is, this campaign will help you discover the real Jesus and who he wishes to be for you. We want our entire church family to be all in for this campaign. So we're canceling most of our other church activities during this campaign, except our weekend services, our small groups, and our compassion ministry. Last weekend, we learned about Jesus the Healer. After the message, hundreds of people came forward to receive prayer. It was a powerful time of ministry. If you were one of those people who came forward, we would love to know what happened when you received prayer. Did God heal you? Did you experience the Lord's presence? Let us know by filling out the communication card inside your bulletin and then drop it in the offering bag or bring it to the information center after service. If you're a guest, we're so glad you're here. Would you take a moment and fill out the communication card inside your bulletin? That card helps us get more information to you about all the opportunities and ways you can get involved here at the Vineyard. After the service, bring it to the information center out here in the lobby. We've got a friendly team who would love to get to know you and answer any questions you have. And don't forget, you can keep up to date on everything happening at vineyardnorthphoenix.com or any of our social media. We're so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Well, welcome everyone. So glad that you are here with us today as we continue our series on The Real Jesus. If you happen to be a guest here with us today, my name is Keith. I'm one of the pastors here and I'm honored to be able to, to share with you the teaching today. Um, listen, before we get into the message, we are going to be uh, studying out of the Bible today. So if you have your Bible with you or if you've got your, uh, an app on a smartphone or something like that, we always teach out of the Bible here at the Vineyard. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and turn there, that way you're ready there when we get to it. Um, but before we do that, we're going to be receiving our tithes and offerings. So will you join me as we pray for our offering today and for the teaching? Father God, we love you and we worship you today. We worship you through singing songs together. We worship you through giving of our finances and we worship you through the study of your word. And God, I ask that now as we pause to give back to you from what you have blessed us with financially, God, that you would continue to use that money to transform people's lives here in our community and all around the world, meeting people's real physical needs as, as we seek to minister to them for you, God. And as we study your word today, God, I pray that you would teach each of us, God, that you would anoint me with the gift of teaching and that you would say whatever it is that you want each of us to hear from you today, myself included, and that none of us would leave this place the same way we came in. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we've been doing this series called The Real Jesus, and we've been looking at who Jesus really is. So far, we've talked about who Jesus was in history as, as, a, as a historical figure. We have talked about Jesus as a teacher. And last weekend, we looked at Jesus, the healer. We, have, we had an incredible time of ministry last weekend as people came forward to receive prayer for healing and, and as God poured out tons of healing. We have already heard so many stories 
from people who experienced healing in their lives. And I want to just touch on one of them for you. I want to tell you a story about a guy named Paul. And Paul actually works here at the vineyard in our food and clothing bank. And Paul has lived with 29 years of chronic pain. It affects everything about his life. It affects the way that he moves, the way that he walks. It severely affects his sleep. He, he isn't traditionally able to get good sleep because of the amount of pain that he's in. In, in back pain, double sciatica pain on both sides. And Paul, over the years, has sought various forms of pain relief, from medical to getting healing prayer. And, and from time to time, he'd get a little bit better, but, but then it would get worse again. And Paul is somebody who has always believed in God's healing power. He just figured, you know, maybe it's just not for me. And that's okay if it's not for me. Well, last weekend, Paul received prayer from a couple people. And by the end of the prayer, he was able to stand up completely straight, which he couldn't do before. He was, hold on, hang on, hang on. I appreciate it, but just hang in there. There's more. He was also able to put his arms completely over his head, which he couldn't do before, okay? By the end of the service, his pain was going down and going down and going down. By that evening, by the time that he went to bed, the uh, sciatica pain was almost completely gone. By the time he woke up on Monday morning, the sciatica pain was completely gone. And I touched base with him this morning, and he is still feeling really, really good. He, is, he hasn't had to take any pain medication. He is sleeping better than he has slept in almost 30 years. And he is just ecstatic. He is so excited because he's like, you know, I knew God healed. I just figured it wasn't for me, but it was for me. It was for me this time. And he is experiencing God's healing in his life in a powerful, real way. And I would ask you to, when you think of him, to continue to pray for Paul. He's still got a little bit of lower back pain. So keep praying that God will just completely get rid of that in the name of Jesus. If you got prayer last weekend and either you experienced healing or maybe you just experienced God's presence in a really powerful way, I just want to piggyback on what Tiazra said in the video. We do want to hear your story. Please either maybe put a note on your communication card or send us an email. Let us know your story about what God did last weekend during our ministry time. And listen, if you received prayer last weekend and maybe you didn't experience healing, that's okay. You know, sometimes when we pray for healing, sometimes God heals completely right here and right now in the moment. Sometimes when we pray for healing, nothing happens. And the rest of the time, it's somewhere in between. And we don't always know exactly why. It's just part of the mystery of God's kingdom. And if you want to learn more about that, I would encourage you to sign up for our ministry training one class where we talk about the kingdom of God and we talk about healing and praying for others. And that begins at the, uh, on the last weekend of October. So today, we're going to look at Jesus the Revolutionary. Now, I know most of the time when we think about Jesus, we don't probably think about him being revolutionary. You know, oftentimes when think about, people think about Jesus, we think about Jesus as being, you know, meek and mild and gentle. And, you know, he's got a lamb across his shoulder, you know, and he's hanging out with children because those are the only people that want to be seen with him. You know, we, we don't think of Jesus as being revolutionary. You know, or maybe we think of Jesus as kind of like, you know, floating around on a cloud, completely detached from the problems and the worries of this world, just off on his own little thing, just, you know, disinterested in real problems in the real world. So we don't really see Jesus as a revolutionary. But today we're going to find out that Jesus was actually quite revolutionary. And we're going to look at that today, beginning with what we know as the golden rule. You remember the golden rule? What is it? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Did you know Jesus was the one who said it? Yeah. I had you turn to Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. We've all heard it a million times. It's become really common in our vernacular, right? Teachers use the golden rule as a guide for classroom behavior. And I think most of us would say that the golden rule doesn't sound 
very revolutionary. The golden rule doesn't sound radical. The golden rule, well, it sounds, sounds kind of nice, right? I mean, you can imagine looking up the word nice in the dictionary and finding two things. You could find the golden rule and my picture, right? I, I mean, that's the way it is in my dictionary. But listen, this is one single verse all by itself. And when we read the Bible, we always need to be careful about taking a single verse all by itself. We always need to consider the context. You know, what else is happening around that verse? What is happening at that moment in history? Who is Jesus talking to? So we're going to look at the larger context of that today. What did Jesus really mean by the golden rule? And what we're going to find out is that it wasn't nice. We're going to find out that the golden rule was actually revolutionary. So the context, if you happen to live at the time of Jesus, you would have heard about somebody who was not afraid of entering into human mystery, human misery. You would have heard about somebody who wasn't afraid of confronting the status quo. In fact, Jesus was always getting into trouble with the authorities. It seems as if Jesus was always doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, at least according to the right people. Because see, Jesus spent a lot of his time hanging out with the wrong kind of people. He was labeled as a criminal. In fact, Jesus even died as an enemy of the state. You know, Jesus was somebody who was truly revolutionary, though. We're going to look at that. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 20. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you? and exclude you, and mock you, and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man. When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets that same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now for a time of awful hunger awaits you? What sorrow awaits you who laugh now for the laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow? What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised false prophets. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. This, this is the revolution of the real Jesus. This isn't a revolution of niceness. This is a revolution of radical love. Let's look at a few things that make this a different kind of revolution. The first thing is, it was a revolution that was a reversal 
of what is true of the world. This passage starts out by describing a radical reversal. Over and over in the teaching of Jesus, you hear him describing incredible things that, that, that are a reversal of the order of the world. He says things like, the first will be last. He says that weakness is strength. He says that leaders should be servants. He says that the last will be first. He says that you need to lose your life in order to gain life. There's an incredible upside down nature to the teaching of Jesus. And Jesus also reverses what it means to be rich and what it means to be poor. But Jesus, he didn't just appear out of nowhere and start teaching people nonsense. He's teaching out of a long tradition of God's activity among the Israelites. In fact, the Old Testament is a record of God's activity among his people, the Israelites. And that is what serves as a prelude to the ministry of Jesus. So when Jesus talks about the rich and the poor, he's actually calling God's people back to God's purposes for the world that God himself had revealed a long time ago. So he, he first he speaks to the poor, and then he speaks to the rich. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets that same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now, for a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. And when Jesus teaches that the poor are blessed and that the rich are essentially cursed, he's not saying that you're blessed because you're poor. He's not saying that you're blessed because you have no money. And he's not saying that because you have money and you're rich, that then you're cursed. He's not saying that if, if somehow you can't pay your bills and, and you're going into debt, well, that you just need to tell yourself that everything is good. And he's not saying that if you're swimming in cash that you need to say, oh, this is really terrible. No, what Jesus is doing is he's recalling a great tradition from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament where God lays out blessings for treating the poor with kindness and curses for exploiting the poor. Here's what he says in Deuteronomy. There should be no poor among you, for the Lord your God will greatly bless you in the land he's giving you as a special possession. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. Cursed is anyone who denies justice to foreigners, orphans, or widows. And all the people will reply, amen. Amen, right? Jesus came into a world where the Israelites had been ignoring God's command about the poor for a long time. The rich were becoming richer. The poor were becoming poorer. The rich were lending, but not freely. In some cases, they were charging 45% interest. The rich had pushed aside God's command of generosity. See, Jesus isn't confronting wealth. He's confronting perverted wealth because of people ignoring God's commands about generosity. Jesus is saying, you know, while other people are looking the other way, God isn't. God sees this. And this story isn't over. There is more to come. The revolution of Jesus is a revolution that's a reversal of what's true of this world. And it's also a revolution to treat your enemies like you would your friends. 
It's a revolution to treat your enemies like you would your friends. Look back at verses 27 and 28. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Now this is something that was totally new. See, Jesus arrived in a culture that was very tit for tat. You know, the law that God gave Moses in Exodus 21 says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. I mean, it's in the Bible, right? Now, you remember what I said earlier about context? See, a big part of the context of this verse, which is a very small part of a much larger section of Scripture, is the cultural historical context. See, at this time, this was a big improvement on the laws and the punishments of the surrounding cultures. Most cultures at that time would demand a price, a punishment much greater than the offense. Now, besides just that, eye for an eye is not a commandment. It's a limit. It's a limit to ensure that the punishment fits the crime. But Jesus teaches something entirely new and totally unthinkable. Love your enemies? Do good to them? You know what that really means? It means think of the best thing that you can do for the worst person you know and go ahead and do it. Think of people that that you're tempted to be nasty toward and then lavish generosity on them. Think of people, you know, think, think of that person that you work with. That You know the one. He's so incredibly annoying. They just get you every time. Think of that person and then write them a card. Praise their good qualities. Dear James, you have an incredible mustache. Love, Keith. You know, if you're married and you're in the middle of a heated argument with your spouse, take a time out and then get out your phone and order flowers. You know, if, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, speed up to them and then blow them a kiss. <laughs> Just make sure you use all of your fingers when you're doing it. The revolution of Jesus is a revolution that's a reversal of what's true of this world. It's a revolution of treating your enemies like you would your friends. And the revolution of Jesus is also a revolution that takes place through self-sacrifice. Look at what he says in verses 29 and 30. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. You know, it's very difficult to get around the fact that Jesus was serious about nonviolence. In fact, it would be very difficult to find anything in the teaching of Jesus that would justify any kind of violence. You know, one of the most incredible things about the revolution of Jesus is that it's completely counter to the way revolutions work. You know, we understand the way revolutions work. Revolutions work by grabbing your gun, by strapping on a bomb, by hopping in a tank, by marching into the capital and overthrowing it by force. But that's not the revolution of Jesus. That's not the way the revolution of Jesus works. Jesus didn't strap on a sword and hop on a war horse and ride into Jerusalem to overthrow. No, Jesus rode on the back of a donkey and he offered himself up as a sacrifice. 
this self-sacrificial giving, this is at the heart of Christianity. This self-sacrificial giving is at the heart of following Jesus. It's one of the things that makes Jesus himself so compelling. Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. It's a study of the early centuries of Christianity, and it describes how Christianity grew from a tiny, persecuted group of followers of a crucified Messiah to the official religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. And Stark found something remarkable. He, early on in the book, he describes some of the, the heroic acts of Christians at the risk of their own lives. You know, uh, when a plague would strike a town, the rich, the well-to-do, the doctors, they would gather up their family and their possessions and they would leave. But the Christians, who were often among the poorest of the poor, who were many of them slaves, they would stay behind and they would nurse the sick people. And they were nursing not just their own family members, but total strangers. And many of them ended up getting sick themselves and ended up giving their lives for the ones that they stayed to care for. That is at the heart of Christianity. And that is what you still see around the world even today. If you go to the most desperate places of the world, you know what you're going to find there? You're going to find Christian doctors and Christian nurses and Christian missionaries who are serving the poor at the risk of their own lives. And the revolution of Jesus takes place through self-sacrifice. And the fourth thing about this revolution of Jesus is it's a revolution that asks for the impossible. Jesus asks us, to do the impossible. You know, he gives us the golden rule, do others as you would have them do to you. And then he goes on from there. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to the, only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Jesus is saying, look, in case there's any doubt about what I mean, I'm not talking about how you treat nice people. I'm not talking about how you treat decent people. I'm not talking about how you treat good people. I'm not talking about how you treat your friends. I'm not talking about how you treat people who love you. I'm talking about treating the worst people, mean people, evil people, people who hate you. I'm talking treat those people the way that you want to be treated. I mean, that seems impossible, doesn't it? But that's what Jesus calls us to do. So why should we join this revolution? I mean, if you have any doubts about whether or not you should start to follow Jesus, I'm sure you have some serious doubts now. Because what Jesus has laid out for us here is a great formula for messing up your life. I hope you now know that if you follow Jesus, he is going to ask you to do ridiculous things. He's going to ask you to do things that don't make any sense. He's going to ask you to do things that cost you. He's going to ask you to do things that may harm you. He's going to ask you to do things that seem impossible. He's going to ask you to do things that make you feel uncomfortable. Ooh. I don't know about you. I love to be comfortable. I think most of us do. So why join the revolution of Jesus? Because it's good for you. It's good for you. Let, let me give you just one of the concepts that Jesus teaches. The concept of forgiveness. There's a guy by the name of Everett Worthington. 
and he's a researcher of forgiveness. He has spent his entire career studying the positive effects of forgiveness. And here's some of what he found in his research. At one study in Hope College, people were asked to think about someone who had hurt them, mistreated them, someone who had offended them. And while they thought about this person and his or her past offense, he would monitor their blood pressure, their heart rate, their facial muscle tension, their sweat gland activity. And when people recalled a grudge, their blood pressure, their heart rate increased. They sweated more. When they thought about a grudge, it increased their stress level immensely. It made them feel angry, sad, anxious, less in control. Then he asked people to try to empathize with their offenders. He asked them to try to imagine forgiving them. When they practiced forgiveness, all the indicators moved downward. And their stress level went back to normal. In another study of nearly 1,500 Americans, they were asked the degree to which each of them practiced and experienced forgiveness. And participants reported on their physical and mental health. The research found a few things. It found that older and middle-aged people forgave others more often than did younger people. They also found that those people felt more forgiven by God. What's more, they found a significant relationship between forgiving others and positive health. People over 45 years of age who had forgiven others reported greater satisfaction with their lives. They were less likely to report feelings of nervousness. They were less likely to report feelings of restlessness and sadness. Now listen, I'm not saying that if you forgive people that all your problems are going to go away. I'm not saying that if you forgive people that your life's just going to be perfect from then on. What I am saying is that when you move toward forgiveness, you're taking a movement toward better health. Choosing to forgive is a movement toward greater health and greater satisfaction. That's the first reason. The second reason to join this revolution is because it's God's new reality. This revolution is God's new reality. Look at verse 36. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Now, th this is not just a description of God's character. This is a description of what God's world is like. God's world is a world of forgiveness, of generosity, of sacrificial service, of compassion. God's world is a world where the poor are filled. It's a world where the meek are lifted up. Jesus wasn't offering an alternative political solution. Jesus wasn't offering a right-wing solution or a left-wing solution. Jesus is saying that something is happening that wasn't the case before, but it was meant to be. And he's saying that this is what life will be like in the future. See, what Jesus is giving is an eternal perspective. You hear this over and over again in his teaching. Look back at verse 35. Love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. On the one hand, Jesus is saying that his followers have to take a long view to recognize that this life is not all there is. You can suffer now in the short term because there is a long-term reward. But that's only half of it. What Jesus taught is that this isn't something that begins when we die. We often have this idea that eternity begins when we die, but it doesn't. Look at what Jesus meant. Look at Luke 17. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. The kingdom of God has already begun. 
The new reality has already begun. This is God's new reality right now. And Jesus says, you can enter it right now. So how? How do we join the revolution of Jesus? We need three movements for this. The first movement we need is a movement in the heart. See, if what Jesus is proposing is a new way of being human, then the normal way that we think about the golden rule, that's simply not adequate. The normal way we think about the golden rule, that might look something like this, a formula look like this. Your awesomeness plus be nice equals the new human. So be awesome, be nice, and that's the new way of being human. I've almost got the awesomeness part nailed. Really close. And we've just seen that's not the teaching of Jesus. So our natural reaction to life in this world is not to live out what Jesus has described here. The truth is we are not always nice people. Especially, especially when we feel we've been the victim of some sort of injustice. And listen, I'm not even talking about real injustice because there is real injustice in the world. I'm talking about when I'm the victim of some sort of injustice in my life. Let me, let me give you an example. I have a, a device, it's called a Kindle. And I love that thing. I can, I can read books on it. I can read comic books on it. I can play games on it. And sometimes I want to use it. And I can't find it. You feel me, right? That's frustrating. I, can't, I want to use my Kindle and I can't find it. And so I look around and eventually, eventually it turns up. I won't tell you where because that, that'll be a spoiler. Eventually I find my Kindle, but I find it in a state that is completely unusable. The battery is dead. Oh, man. I'm becoming less and less of a nice person all the time as this unfolds. So I get it recovered. I plug it into the charger. And then I got to wait because you can't turn it back on right away. It's got to get a little bit of charge. It gets charged up enough for me to actually turn it on. And I, go to, I turn it on and I go to log in and I see what I already know. I was not the last person to use my Kindle, right? I won't, I will tell you who it was. It's my son. Let me tell you what, at that moment, I am the least nice person I can be. And that's my son. I love him, right? He means the world to me. But I forgive him eventually. Listen, on our own, we are not nice people. This is the only formula that will work for us. Death plus resurrection equals the new human. Jesus' death, my death to my old life, plus Jesus' resurrection, plus my entering into the new life in Jesus equals the new human. This is where the idea of Jesus' revolution is similar to the way that we think about revolutions. Because when we think about revolutions, we think about history class. We think about things like the French Revolution or the American Revolution or the Industrial Revolution. We think about a significant moment or a significant time in history when things just got completely turned around, completely different from the way that they had been before. The word revolution comes from a Latin root word, revolveri. And Jesus uses the word in Greek, metanoia. It means to turn around, revolution, to revolve, to turn around. When we translate the Greek New Testament into English, we use the word repent. Repent means to turn around. So when Jesus is saying, repent, 
For the kingdom of God is at hand. In essence, what Jesus is saying is revolution. For the kingdom of God is at hand. It's a total turnaround. And it begins with a change of heart. There are some of us here today who need to make a heart exchange with Jesus. You know, maybe, maybe you're angry towards someone right now. Maybe, maybe somebody's hurt you. Maybe somebody's offended you. Maybe they've ripped you off. Maybe you were even thinking about that on the way to church today, about how much that person has hurt you. What if you invited Jesus into that place right now and said, Jesus, would you exchange this feeling that I'm having with a feeling of mercy toward them? Would you exchange this feeling that I'm having with a feeling of freedom toward them? Or, or maybe you're anxious and worried about your finances. You feel like you never have enough. And over time, your anxiety about your finances has turned inward to the point that you don't really give to others in need. Your heart isn't moved when you see a person in need. Maybe you feel suspicious towards them. Maybe you feel judgmental towards them. And Jesus would like to make an exchange with you. Jesus, would you exchange my attitude with generosity. The first movement that's needed for this revolution is a movement in the heart. The second movement that's needed is a movement in our relationships. It's a movement in our relationships. It's a movement in the way we relate to the people around us and to the people that we don't know. When Jesus comes into our hearts, he changes the way that we see people. If we let him. If we let him, he changes the way that we see people. We no longer simply see people as someone who is addicted. We no longer see people as someone who is straight or gay. We no longer see somebody, people as somebody who is rich or poor. We no longer see people by the color of their skin. We no longer see beautiful people or smart people or successful people. We just begin to see everyone as a person in need of love. We see everyone as a person in need of mercy. We are all in need of love. We are all in need of the redemptive, life-changing power of God's mercy. It's a movement in our relationships. And the third movement needed for this revolution is a movement in our society. Let me give you an example. There's a woman named Sojourner Truth. She was born into slavery in New York City in the early 1800s. But she escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. After going to court to recover her son, in 1828, she became the first black woman to win such a case against a white man. She gave herself the name Sojourner Truth in 1843 after she became convinced that God had called her to testify to the truth that was in her. During the Civil War, Truth helped recruit black troops for the Union Army. After the war, she lobbied to secure land grants from the government for former slaves. She made an incredible difference with her life. The movement of Jesus, the revolutionary movement of Jesus, is a movement that affects our society. So how about us? What are we going to do? You know... As part of the Real Jesus campaign, we want to model the servant heart of Jesus by caring for people. And I want to encourage you to do that in two ways. First, I hope that you are already a part of a campaign small group. And I want to challenge your group to find a way to serve together. Maybe through our food and clothing bank or maybe by putting together care packages for the homeless. Whatever it is, as a small group, find a way that you can serve others together. But I also want to challenge us to give. Now, you already know that when you give to the vineyard, 
through your regular tithes and offerings. Part of that money goes to helping individuals and families in our community through our regular food bank activities. Six days a week, the food and clothing bank is open, and through it, we're able to minister to about 200 families every week to meet their real physical needs with food and clothing. About 200 families every week. Now that's just a piece of what the revolution of Jesus means. See, there are times when the circumstances demand that we go a little further. When the circumstances ask that we give a little more. So right now, as a church family, we want to model the servant heart of Jesus by caring for people. I'm sure that you're all aware that Hurricane Dorian recently decimated the Bahamas. The death toll actually continues to rise. The people of the Bahamas have been severely affected. Now, as part of the Vineyard Movement, as part of Vineyard USA, we are partnered with an organization called Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope is a faith-based, nonprofit organization with a driving passion to feed the world through children's feeding initiatives, community outreaches, and disaster response. In the aftermath, this is, yeah. In the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, Convoy of Hope had boots on the ground going to work, helping people with supplies, with food, with water. And one of the best ways that we can help the people of the Bahamas affected by Hurricane Dorian is by giving to Convoy of Hope. So I want to show you a short video from Convoy of Hope so you can see for yourself what they're up to. Let's see that. Hi, this is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope, and I'm standing with our international director of disaster services, Ryan Grable. And Ryan, you've been on the ground here from the very beginning, right after the disaster hit. So why don't you tell us just a little bit about what you've seen over the last week? Yeah, it came through the Abaco Island in that area and caused mass devastation through storm surge and wind damage. Uh, and then also came through Grand Bahama, a lot of storm surge, uh, flooded out homes and destroyed all of the articles in the homes. And, and the infrastructure has been absolutely wiped out as well. I mean, no running water, no electricity. Let's get specific. What is Convoy of Hope and our partners doing to meet real needs right now? Yeah, so we've mobilized a network of planes, boats, ferries, uh, containers to get to bring product in here as quick as possible on various islands. So it's changed a little bit each day on what the best method is to get product to people quickly. But we just take it each day with, with the options that we have in order to get the product into the hands of the people who need it. Why don't you talk about Convoy of Hope and our, our staying power? A lot of these disasters uh, take years and years and years to put things back together. And so our commitment is to walk alongside these families and continue to help them in this process as they recover. Someone's watching this back home. What can they do to help us help people of the Bahamas? Uh, prayer through giving and uh, just continuing to follow what we're doing here and tell other people about it so that we can continue to help more people here. So we got an update from Convoy on Friday, and so far they've been able to distribute 405,000 pounds of supplies, including food, hygiene items, and cleaning supplies. They've been able to help about uh, almost 5,000 families and uh, over 16,000 individuals in eight communities across six islands of the Bahamas. So we're going to receive a special offering specifically for Convoy of Hope. Now, I know a lot of you already gave earlier in the service or, or you give online regularly. Listen, that's okay. This is over and above our regular giving. And all the money that we collect right now will go directly to Convoy of Hope. The ushers are going to be passing the offering bags, but if you normally give by text or online or at the giving kiosk in the lobby, you can designate this gift specifically to Hurricane Relief by either selecting Hurricane Relief or by using the keyword hope. And we'll make sure that your financial gift gets to the right place. The band's going to play a song, and then I'm going to come back up. So listen, we're not done yet, okay? So stick around. Cardinals don't play till 105. All right? Hang on while we receive this special offering. But first, let's pray for it, okay? God, we thank you for organizations like Convoy of Hope that are ready to go at a moment's notice when things like this strike. And Father, we thank you for our partnership with them and ask that you would keep them safe, that you would watch over their workers as they minister to people's real needs. And God, as we uh, give to them now, we ask that you would bless the money that we give 
and that you would use it to, to help people in their real and maybe darkest hour of need right now. And we give it to you, and we ask you to have your way with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
That is what the revolution of Jesus is all about. It's a revolution that takes the things that the enemy and that the world throw at us to wreck us and to just ruin our lives and uses it for good. God turns it around for his victory in our lives. Jesus. Jesus was a revolutionary and we're carrying on his revolution to this day. Now I know some of you here today, you need that revolution. You need that turnaround in your life. In fact, you're desperate for it. It's really easy to get started. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna dismiss the service and all you have to do is just come down and see one of our ministry team members. They would love to pray for you and you just tell them, I need the revolution of Jesus and they'll help you with that. In fact, could I have the ministry team go ahead and come down to be ready? And there's another group of people that I wanna speak to. Maybe you were here last weekend and you wanted to get prayer for healing, but for whatever reason, you didn't. Or maybe you weren't here, but now that you've heard about it, you really wanna get some healing prayer. Please come down and see one of these folks. They would be honored to have the privilege to pray for you for whatever it is that you need. God still heals and he has more healing to pour out even today. If you're able to, could I ask everyone to please stand? And will you just join me as we pray? Father, thank you. Thank you for your deep love for us. Thank you that you are willing and ready to take anything that comes into our lives that's meant for evil and to turn it around for the good in our lives if we'll let you do that. God, thank you for your revolution and thank you that we get to carry it forward today. I pray, God, that you would go with us as we leave this place. I pray blessings over everyone gathered here today, that you would walk with us, that you would go ahead of us and you would help us to continue your revolution. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're a guest, please stop by the guest welcome in the lobby. We'd love to meet you out there. And please join us next weekend as Pastor Brian continues our series on the real Jesus. We'll see you then.